Well, you have done a couple of amazing voyages. Well, one particular voyage in Africa that was pretty amazing. You biked from Cairo all the way down to Cape Town, crossing the entire continent. Yeah, hard to believe. I can't even believe it myself that I did it. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. But it was not, that was actually not the transformative journey that really set you to create Fair Voyage, right? So what really did it for you was Kilimanjaro, is that correct? It was a combination of both. I think both journeys were very crucial for me. And Kilimanjaro gave me the initial idea and um, cycling all the way through Africa gave me the broader vision um, for that idea. Okay, so walk me through that. Okay, so let's take people back to when you first decided, like, why did you even decide to go up Kilimanjaro? Why not just, you guys have a lot of mountains in Switzerland. Why do you need to go down to Kilimanjaro? Mm -hmm. That is an excellent question. Back at the time, a lot of people were asking me exactly that question because, I mean, it's expensive, it's it's uh, it's far away. Um, yeah, why do I have to fly to Africa to climb that mountain? And honestly speaking, I could... No, I was just thinking to myself, is that one of the things that would irritate me, because I was trying to climb the tallest mountain of every African country, and one of the things that sometimes would drive me crazy is that they, it's almost impossible to go up any mountain for free. And, and you always have to take a guide in so many of the mountains in Africa, I mean, probably right. once. And, uh, and in Switzerland, I think that's not the case, right? You can just go up any damn mountain you please, and nobody's going to charge you. That's right. Pretty them. much all over Europe, you can go up any mountain you want, yes. Yeah, for free. <laughs> and so it was just such a... I, it took me a while to just get used to that idea. But anyway, there you were sitting in Switzerland. You're like, huh, right. this is going to cost me, I don't know, $5,000 or whatever it was, maybe $1,000 or 1,000 euros uh, to get yes. up Kilimanjaro. So go ahead. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And I can't give you the answer. I think some people could argue, and I can't deny that it definitely wasn't the case, that back then I was still working in banking and was an investment banker. And so maybe, just maybe, there was this little bit of ego, like I want to prove that I climbed this mountain or that I can do that. Um, for it didn't feel like that to me. Uh, to me, it just seemed, it, it seemed intuition. It seemed to, something was pulling me towards it, and I can't explain it. It just was in me. And I just had this idea uh, stuck in my head and I cannot really say what it was, but I just felt that I wanted to do it. And what year was that? That was um, four years ago, I think, okay. 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And so then you went there and then you saw how the porters were treated. Is that correct? That's what kind of... Yeah, in a nutshell. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I saw a lot, but I heard and learned and experienced a lot and I heard a lot of stories. Um, so the way it happened is that for me, this climbing Kilimanjaro was a big thing. And I started to write a book about my journey already before I climbed the mountain. And so I started to do a lot of research for the book because I wanted to, to have the facts um, for what I was about to publish. And it was because of that writing and research process that I became aware of the issue of porter exploitation on the mountain already before I climbed. And so I already had this mindset when I went there that I wanted to do more fact finding and I was quite inquisitive and I asked a lot of questions. And so, yes, so I then um, actually happened to learn a lot of stories that shocked me and that were a lot worse than I thought um, it would be in, in, in reality. What were some of those stories? Um, so, I mean, just to give you maybe the most extreme story was the story of my own tour guide, my own mountain guide who um, shared with me the story what happened to him years ago when he started to work as a porter on the mountain. And so in his instance, what happened was that he was sleeping in his tent. He woke up in the middle of the night. He was wet because it was raining and the tents they give the porters were poor quality. So he got wet from the rainwater and porters because they carry all the gear for the climbers. And back then they had to carry excessive gear, like way more than now. Now actually the park is quite good in, in monitoring the limits and limiting it to 20 kilos. But back then they were carrying way more than that. And so porters didn't really bring spare clothes for themselves. So he was there on this mountain in wet clothes, very high up. Um, he managed to stay warm by a miracle throughout the night. And in the morning when he was uh, feverish and getting sick on this, I mean, it was almost zero degrees. It started to snow fairly soon. 
and instead of helping him down they um he had to continue working and he kept working and it was snowing and he fainted because um, while well, he was sick and it got too much and everyone else just kept walking and left him lying there and for me that was a wake-up call because I, I had read um, that porters may not get assisted with dissent if they have an accident or fall ill and to me that all sounded very statistical and clinical okay to not get assisted with dissent and then to hear from your own tour guide that this was actually happening and 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 what this really means that this affects human life um, that for me was a big eye-opener and that made it very human um, that took the statistics away from it and, and put a human soul to it but that is just one extreme story I heard and then there was a lot of other things as well um, so was it at that moment when you were either on the mountain or after the mountain or maybe even before the mountain that you thought to yourself okay well I want to go check this out and try to help somehow change this exploitation not really because before i went there um i said to me it was all statistics and i have to say because i was writing a book i probably had this typical journalistic sensational fact-finding kind of mindset so i was not emotionally touched by anything it was okay you go to africa of course people don't always have a perfect life there um, so i didn't feel emotionally connected to it um, and so for me, it was purely um, research and finding facts. Um, it was not something that I felt strongly about. Okay. And then after, was it after the Kilimanjaro trip that you decided to go, I'm going to go bike across the continent? <laughs> yeah, that was, um, I mean, it was a process, right? Nothing happens overnight. But so on Kilimanjaro, two things happened for me. First, it had been my first trip to Africa, and it was quite an eye-opener that, um, well, at least Tanzania. Of course, Tanzania is one, only one country in Africa, but it was very different from what I thought it might be. I mean, I had this typical European prejudice of, um, you know, Africa being scary and dangerous, and disease and war and whatsoever. And of course, as you know, um, it's, it's nothing like that. And so that was an eye-opener, and I just wanted to see more of Africa. And the other thing that happened to me is um, I'm probably one of those extreme people who handled the altitude fairly well. So I felt, oh, Kilimanjaro that I thought would be so difficult was really easy for me. And so somehow with Kilimanjaro, I discovered for the first time in my life that my that I might have some physical abilities that I wasn't aware of. So I was just very intrigued to challenge myself. And so when I learned about this cycling trip, it just seemed like the perfect match for what I wanted to do. Okay, and then tell us a little bit about the how how long did it take to go from Cairo all the way down to Cape Town? That was a four month trip, and it's sorry. No, go ahead. And then and and it was with a group, organized yes, group. Yes, so right? yes, exactly. It was an organized group, and the way it works. So there's one company, two of the three co-organizers did every year, and they've done it now for over ten years. And that's why already at the outset, you know, it takes four months because they plan every day um, where you should cycle and in which campsite you're going to be overnight. And so while it may sound like four months is a long time, and yes, it is a long time, what made it actually challenging is because the daily route that you had to go and the campsites were fixed. So you really had to stay in that schedule and go every day the, the predetermined route. So even if you felt sick or you just really didn't feel like it or it was raining or poor weather, you still had to do it. Right. So but what would happen, though? Because obviously some people had to get injured. I mean, there's a group. How many people in the group? About 10 or more? No, I think so in our year, because I think it was the 10th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, it was, um, I think it was 27 or almost 30 people who attempted to do the whole, um, the okay. whole route. So statistically, down. it was, and it was the whole group minus somebody one person had to get injured, arrived. Right? Yes, yes, and we did have a fair amount of injuries um, and sicknesses and a lot of things happened. Um, so the way they do it is they have accompanying vehicles, so the trucks that they use to carry the gear as well. And they also have one truck that keeps going up and down the path um, during the day to make sure there's no problems. And so if you're sick, you don't have to cycle. You go and sit on, 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 those, on one of those accompanying vehicles. Got it. Okay. Did you, now you 
went through 45 degrees Celsius temperatures and you didn't, you, I, I saw your video, which by the way is on YouTube and it was, it was fun. It's very well done. Uh, your, your video that summarizes uh, the trip, at least through Sudan. Um, and I thought, you know, you were on the brink of exhaustion at one point, right? Weren't you actually probably more than one point. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I definitely was in Sudan. It was really going, I mean, many times, but especially in Sudan, we were really reaching our boundaries, both physically and emotionally. And as you say, I mean, we had this one day with over 50 degrees. And to me, I was very afraid of the heat even before going because I'm not a sunny kind of person. I prefer to avoid the sun. And for me, everything about 35 degrees just feels the same. I don't even feel the difference anymore. So, um, yeah, that was definitely not easy. Right? I mean, you then saw it on the video in Sudan. Um, that was real. I was really crying and I was really miserable that one day. Yes. Right. Um, okay. So now at, at that point, where was Fair Voyage in your ideas to execution? Where were you at that stage? Right. So Fair Voyage back then didn't even exist in my mind. Mm -hmm. I was uh, thinking about um, the predecessor of Fair Voyage, which uh, the initial version I called Killigate, which was in essence Fair Voyage just for Kilimanjaro. So all the way while cycling, I kept thinking about building this ethical climbing platform for Kilimanjaro and doing something about the port exploitation on Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. So that idea I kept playing with um, all the way while cycling. And I got really actually very keen towards the end to finally get started with it. But it was only after um, I completed the cycling trip and I was a bit of a high because I managed to do all of that and cycle all the way. And that was a big project for me as well. And I didn't, well, I believed, um, but I think a lot of people believed it wouldn't be possible for me to do that. And so I was a bit, um, it, it helped me to expand my vision, to expand the vision and the thinking of what could be possible in life. And so that cycling then helped me expand the vision from just doing it for Kilimanjaro to say, let's try to build this globally. Um, also for other mountain destinations and other touristic destinations globally. What are some of the mistakes, Alex, that people make when planning their trips and things that they may not even consider, things that you probably didn't think about beforehand regarding ethical travel, being fair and all this other stuff? What are things that a lot of people overlook that you would like to draw attention to? Mm -hmm. Well, I think first, a lot of people are just not aware that there may be problems in travel. So I think there's a lot of awareness already regarding sustainable fashion and sustainable food. For in travel, um, there's a lot of talk about carbon credits and environmentally friendly travel. But I think a lot of people are not aware that there's also social and ethical issues in travel. And I think the problem is um, the reason why we are not aware. I mean, it's not our fault. It's just there's not a lot of awareness out there. And I think this has two reasons. The first reason is um, may maybe even less so in the US, but as, so me coming from Europe and Europe generally having, you know, fairly high labor standards, social security for, for any work in any industry. Uh, we just take this as a given and we don't even assume that when we go travel, maybe the people who are providing our travel services don't have that kind of protection. And then I think the second challenge that is particularly there in travel is that while for a lot of the supply chains in other industries, uh, we never get to see them, right? We never go to Bangladesh and, and visit a sweatshop. We never go to most people don't fly to Ethiopia and visit a coffee farm and so forth. But in travel, we actually go and see on the ground what it's like. And so I think a lot of travelers make the mistake. We go somewhere for two weeks, we see what we are meant to see, and and we believe we've seen it all and we we know it all and now we are the experts. And I think this is a really dangerous situation. And what I experienced on Kilimanjaro has just shown that because I didn't overtly, obviously, see this exploitation. Uh, I did not see that they don't get paid. I did not see what happens when they have an accident. Um, so we see that there are porters and they carry gear and they look reasonably dressed. 
And so we believe, okay, they are well treated, they're well off. And so, however, a lot of this exploitation and abuse is, is hidden to us. Um, and so this is, I think, a dangerous situation that we travelers go. We travel, uh, we become best friends with our guides. Um, the guides can be the best actors and make us believe that they are really good people. <laughs> and um, we don't see that there's actually people at the bottom um, of the pyramid who don't speak English, who we don't get to interact with and who may not be treated so well. Um, and that's a dangerous situation, I think. It's a tough thing, though, maybe what you're asking people to do. You're asking them to see, in some cases, the invisible. Yes, and we can't. No, travelers can't. And I've also seen that even if you as a traveler say you want to make the right booking decision and book with an ethical um, and responsible company, it's almost impossible. Because if you go online, there is so much misleading and incorrect information. And nowadays, um, sustainability is the thing, right? And companies aren't stupid. They tell us what we want to hear. And so every company is telling us about all the beautiful efforts they are doing. And so unless we are spending weeks and months of research and diligence, which, I mean, let's be realistic, we don't have the time. We cannot expect any traveler to do that. It's just not possible to know what's really going on. And even on the ground, because those people who are affected, I mean, either they can't even speak English or even if they can speak English, they would be far too afraid of losing their job to tell us the truth. So there's just no way we travelers can really see the full reality. But why would somebody be afraid of losing the shitty job? I mean, in other words, if their job is so shitty and so terrible and they're so exploited, why would not they wa want desperately to hold on to this crap job? Because it's a work opportunity, because they have children who they want to send to school, they have a family, they have their elders who they need to take care of. So they will do everything they can do to get a job, and even if it's a shitty job. And uh, I mean, sticking with the example of Kilimanjaro, to start working as a supporter, it may be a shitty job. Um, but a lot of people also have the hope that they can progress, they become a senior porter and then they can become an assistant guide and eventually they all hope to become a mountain guide. So there's also a, um, a future path of progression that they see in this opportunity. And yeah, I mean, as I said, they, they have um, a family, they have a life, they need to feed their children. So of course they would still rather have a shitty job than no job. Right. I, I, I agree with that. But some people might go further and say, okay, well, and, and this, by the way, I, I found in some cases in Africa where people say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm only going to get $2 a day, but first of all, uh, my cost of living is only a dollar and 80 cents. I'll give you an example. When I was in Benin, I stayed for one, or actually two months in a place. Uh, it was a two room apartment. So it had a bedroom and it had a living room. That's it. And I had a shower area and then I had a shared outhouse that I would use other people. So pretty basic, but it was in a town of 25,000 people. $10. That's how much it cost me. Not per day, not per week, but $10 per month. <laughs> it cost me to stay there. So I was thinking to myself, wow, if I'm making just $1 a day, I make $30 a month. Well, then one third of my revenue is going to pay for my housing costs, which coming from San Francisco, nobody spends a third of their revenue. Everybody spends more than a third of their revenue on, on housing costs of their income, should I say. So well, what do you say when they're saying, okay, $2 sounds like nothing in Switzerland or in, in San Francisco, but for them, $2 means something. You're very right, and it's um, we need to be very careful that we don't bring our international Western standards and apply them locally. So the way it needs to work is that these standards, what is applicable for a country and what should be the minimum fair standards in a country or for a destination, needs to be determined locally by local stakeholders, our stakeholders, taking into the consideration the, the local living costs, the local standards, what's locally feasible. So again, taking the example of Kilimanjaro, Charo, the, um, the fair living wage um, that is being recommended for porters 
by the companies that we recommend and that are partnering with so called um, the so called Kilimanjaro Portis Assistance Project, which is a local NGO that monitors the situation. That living wage is not something that foreign companies and foreign people have um, have invented. It's something that's actually been agreed by local stakeholders, Tanzanian organizations, including the Kilimanjaro National Park. Um, taking into the consideration the local living um, cost of living and living standards. Okay, uh, that's good. So f wherever we go and and um, and determine or define what should be the minimum, it always needs to be agreed locally with local stakeholders. Okay. Now I imagine what is Fair Voyage doing is you're, when you talked before you said that the people nobody wants to make weeks or certainly months of research before they decide to book their trip to go to Nepal or to go to Africa. Um, I imagine what you're doing is you're doing all that heavy lifting, that legwork to figure out the research so that people just say, okay, I'm going to go to fairvoyage.com and I'm going to then just find a trip that has already been vetted. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, you might wonder how we do this or how can we do this? I mean, me sitting in Switzerland, how do I know what's going on in the ground? And we are firm believers that something like this, such a sustainable travel solution, can only work in cooperation with local partners and independent organizations that are doing on-site audits on the ground in the field. And this is not so these local audits. Yes, we meet the companies that we promote and we travel as well and, and we know our suppliers. But I can't claim just because I met a company once or I meet them once a year that I really know what's happening on the field. So the only way this can work and create a, a lasting, a sustainable solution is by cooperating with independent audit organizations that are doing the checks locally. And that's really our model to decide which of these organizations out there. I mean, there's thousands of them and only a handful are really credible and doing sound work. But these organizations that are doing sound audits, they are out there. And so what we are doing is really saying which of these organizations organizations have a far of audit um, that really checks um, what we believe should be checked for a destination and then select companies um, that are audited by those organizations or encourage the partner companies, the companies we want to promote because we believe they are already doing the right thing to also over time become um, audited by an independent organization. I hate to be so cynical, Alexandra, but having spent five years in Africa, I, I, there's a little bit of cynicism in me where I know the level of corruption is amazing. So I'm just imagining myself, okay, so you're working with a local organization to try to determine who's, you know, these ethical standards, since it's hard for you far away to do that. I understand that idea. But what's to stop some guy who has a cousin who has his own little porter company? I mean, well, let's just pick Kilimanjaro as a simple thing. So he's got his own touring company for Kilimanjaro and his cousin runs this company and he just says you know hey cousin i'm or brother whatever i'm gonna pay you a hundred dollars or whatever they bribe him basically and just give me the a-ok -okay, you know the approval so that fair voyage sends me some business right it's a fair question and corruption is definitely or, or politically different environment is a reality in, in most countries in africa um, now, with um, the specific example of Kilimanjaro, um, the organization locally that I mentioned, KPAP, the Kilimanjaro Portis Assistance Project, they have a um, very strong leadership, um, um, a person who is really, I mean, has a reputation across uh, Mochi and the Russia and that area for in, um, around Kilimanjaro for being the opposite of corruptible. Um, so there, and the partners are all part of that program, all the companies that, that are involved with this organization, and they kind of also look out for each other. Um, there, it's just a question of having the right leadership and a person in place who, who is, um, well, who is not corruptible. So arguably you can now say, how do you know and how can you prove this? So one thing I'm actually, I've been um, giving technical support to that organization. And one thing we're working on is making all that auditing, that monitoring, bringing this into, um, into a system and making it more centralized. And then over time, hopefully also bring it, what I would call into the cloud so that um, it's becoming more public and be can be tracked easier so that actually that issue of corruptibility becomes less. So the vision would be that after every single climb or trip or tour, um, there is an immediate audit 
and then if there is an issue it can be immediately raised and commented so it becomes more and more difficult over time to say if you wait until the end of the season and then a company passes and you could say well yeah they bribed someone if you do this audit after every single climb or after every single tour um, that is one way and create a lot more transparency for the public also to see what's going on that might be one way of preventing that issue um, and yeah I, I'm, I'm a believer that it requires transparency the more transparency we have in whatever is going on the, the less corruption there can be but even with um, I'm just thinking because so Kilimanjaro is only one example where there's a local um, NGO that's doing a lot of audit work for other destinations where there are where there is currently and that's actually most of the destinations where there currently is no good local audit scheme mm -hmm. we recommend and partner with global organizations such as Travel Life Travel Life is kind of like the fair trade in tourism they operate two operators uh, sorry audit two operators mm -hmm. um, for their um, for operating in consistency with the UN um, sustainable development goals and the way they do it is they also have an on-site audit but you could rightly say or, um, or question well this auditor who goes local um, this person could be corruptible right and I think in any supply chain, and it's the same in food and fashion and everywhere where we have an organic or eco label, there will be this problem. Um, now, what do we do about it? I think the more transparency we create, um, that's the first step. Um, and I think it's still better at, with the risk that maybe, I know, a few percent will have a corruption issue than not doing anything at all in the first place. Um, so I think the more transparency we create, um, the better. What about, let's talk about another philosophical, thank you for the answer, but f let's talk about another philosophical argument that you might have. For example, you and I presumably were working roughly 40 to 60 hours a week. Now, maybe in the next century, that's going to look like exploitive labor. In other words, completely unfair, like, cause everybody else is working only 20 hours a week in the, in the hundred years from now, we're all working 20 hours a week, or maybe only 10 hours a week. <laughs> um, and so just, in, that's a nice wish. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> so, but the point is, is that we look at the ways that people were working in the 19th century as completely barbaric and crazy exploitive, you know, the, the way, child labor and just sweatshops like crazy. And then our quote unquote sweatshops or the Nike sweatshops or whatever, all these other things that people complain about today in comparison are, you know, much better. So it's a, sh it seems like it's a shifting standard to, to decide. And obviously what is a shit job in Switzerland is, is like a glamorous job <laughs> in let's say, uh, I don't know, um, Eritrea or something like that. So, uh, what would you, um, how do you deal with deciding, you know, these standards over time or across space? It sounds like you're just saying, okay, well, we'll look at whatever is the local norms and then just try to be on the high end of those norms. Is that fair to say? Yes, you could say it like that. And I guess I'm just making my life here a bit easier. Um, I'm saying Fair Voyage is not in the business of auditing companies. We are in the business of just seeing what's out there and selecting the best ones. Um, coming back to the example I gave Travel Life, um, they are, so this is a global standard, um, a responsible travel um, audit uh, and monitoring organization. And they are accredited by the United Nations Global Sustainable Tourism Council for having their standards um, in accordance with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So the way I'm making my life easy is saying, well, we at Fair Voyage don't need to determine what these specific standards are. We see our, our, our part in the broader um, ecosystem as just promoting the right companies. We trust that if the United Nations says, these are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and if the UN uh, Global Sustainable Tourism Council says yes, Travel Life and some other um, organizations audit companies in accordance with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, then I, what I'm saying as Fair Voyage is we trust that they have made the right decisions and they are adjusting their standards in the right way. Um, and they again, so again, stay, um, staying with Travel Life, for example, what they do is they don't have the same set of standards um, globally and everyone has to apply to the same standards. 
but they localize it. So if they bring it, for example, to Tanzania, they sit with the local stakeholders and say, okay, what is applicable here? What can we do in Tanzania? What makes sense? And so I simply trust that such an organization that becomes accredited by the UN Global Sustainable Tourism Council knows what they are doing and that I don't need to recheck um, their standards. Got it. Now, what kind of premium should most people expect to pay? Let's say they're going to Fair Voyage and I you've got say have three operators in Kilimanjaro. We'll stick with Kilimanjaro since it's a simple example. I know you deal with a lot more destinations than just that, but let's say you have three um, people that you work with, three companies that you work with in Kilimanjaro. Now, what kind of premium should you expect to pay over, let's say the cheap bottom of the barrel place? Or is it 50% more expensive, twice as expensive as you know, because obviously if being ethical and um, fair was cheap or easy, <laughs> then everybody would probably be doing it. They're not exploiting people just because they're, they're sadists. They're doing it because they're trying to save a few dollars. Um, so what, so obviously being fair has to cost extra. So what kind of premium is, is uh, have you measured that and what would it be? It really depends how far down um, towards the low budget you go. And there is unfortunately a lot of illegal stuff also happening. So I don't even want to know what the lowest, very lowest, lowest price is. But if I just do research online and I'm shocked, I mean, there is predominantly out of India, sadly, um, quite a few platforms that uh, promote very cheap prices and they promote prices that are almost half of what we would have so a trip that with us costs about two thousand they would sell for a thousand and i'm just shocked how possibly they could even do it because uh, there are park fees you need to pay your staff um, there are locally agreed minimum wages so if you play by the rules and you have licensed guides and you operate legally there is just no way they could possibly sell it for half the price. Then, um, not even fair voyage, all the ethical companies compared to all the ethical operators. Um, if you say, no, so, so, the, so the answer is, if you go with a legally operating company that's playing by the rules, we are actually having the cheapest prices. If you go with companies that are not playing 100% legally, that are not paying the fair minimum wages that are locally agreed, that maybe bribing some officials to get into the park without paying fees, um, then I guess you could get it maybe in the extreme case, 50%, 30%, maybe even 70% lower. I don't know, but it's getting into really dodgy and also dangerous territory um, if companies are selling it like that. It seems like you'll be fighting a real uphill battle because you're fighting against a wave of tourism that's going to be coming from East Asia, including India, as well as China, where you have this rising middle class and vast populations, and yet they're rising, so they, ha they have this desire to travel, but they just don't have that much money. And so therefore, you're talking about these Indians who are kind of really leading the charge for bottom basement prices for Kilimanjaro, but I imagine it's something that is only going to get worse. Same thing with China. They have to send all. They have Chinese who who, who may not be able to afford to spend two thousand dollars, and for them, saving you know five hundred bucks is means a, a ton to them. So obviously, it happens anywhere, but especially out there where they're just doing this aspirational travel. Mm -hmm. If you follow, what I'm saying. So is this kind of going to be? Is this some a big worry of yours? It is a worry, yes, from an ethical point of view. It's not a worry from a business point of view. So we have already learned this lesson and it's very clear that this um, awareness and the demand from travelers to make ethical travel decisions, to book sustainable trips, we are seeing it very clearly that this is coming out of Europe, uh, parts of the US, especially um, um, San Francisco and the West Coast and also the East Coast. Um, it's coming out of parts of Canada, it's coming out of Australia and New Zealand, um, but that's more or less it. Um, it's very, you're very, you're right, it's very hard to convince consumers out of Asia or other parts of the world um, to travel ethically, simply because I think the awareness and the mindset is not there yet, and it will take time for it to develop. I mean, 
being sustainable, being ethical, it's almost a, a luxury kind of or a, a high income country mindset. And even we need to go through this process. And it's only also in Europe and in America, it's only the last 10 years that it's become a big thing. And so I don't know how long it will take for India or China to de um, develop this um, consciousness mindset, this sustainability mindset. So from that point of view, um, so you're right. And we're seeing this as well, that out of, for example, Asia, the demand is not there or out of the Middle East. Um, it's worrying because there will be continuing to be um, exploitation of human and natural resources in travel because of that. Um, for us, it's less of a worry from as a worry from a pure business point of view because we just simply don't focus on these markets. We focus on markets where consumers are conscious and want to make the right decisions. Now, what do you say to the people who might accuse you of suffering from the white savior complex, which is this idea that white people go out to Africa to save the locals and to, you know, fix everything and to impose their values onto the locals. And, you know, we should just leave Africa and leave them alone and let them do things on their own. And, and, you know, Africans should solve African problems and the white people should just get out um, and, and quit trying to save the planet. Yeah, I think there's certainly truth in it. And I think a lot of bad things happened because, as you say, white people coming and imposing their standards and not knowing what's really going on on the ground and then actually causing more problems um, over the long term than solutions. I mean, I've seen that myself when we cycled through Africa and then when we came to the poorest country that actually received the most development aid per capita, which is Malawi. Um, it just became extreme, like kids running into the middle of the road and begging for money. And it's just this mindset of, of white people give me money. And so I've seen with my own eyes how, how damaging this development aid, if not done in the right way, can be. Now, maybe I do have a savior syndrome or at least a syndrome that I want some meaning in my life. And this is now giving me meaning. But what I would say to that is, I'm not predominant. So I, we are focusing two problems at Fair Voyage. We are focusing on the travelers. So the problems that travelers are having when booking these trips and thereby having a local impact. Now, as, as we discussed earlier, for the local impact side um, and the work local, locally, it's not us who is going there and imposing what should be right. We're just saying like, we're just promoting what locally has been determined should be uh, minimum fair standards. And our value add is actually reaching out to the global travelers. So we are actually um, having the marketing side in this uh, supply chain. We are um, serving these travelers that are people like you and me. Uh, we are being close to that market and making it easier for them uh, if they want to do so, to make sustainable travel decisions. So I see it as, um, I don't see us as going to Africa and imposing what should happen there. I see it actually as a partnership between what they already say locally is a fair standard and us just making sure that the travelers, um, that we channel the demand from conscious consumers to the right companies. Fair enough. Now, if you could magically change people's minds and their travel habits, what would happen? What would you get them to do? I would get them to plan and prepare the trip uh, sooner and do a bit more, at least a little bit more research uh, and planning and preparation before they go. Now we are seeing there are some people who start um, planning like almost a year or longer ahead and who are doing really all this research and trying to understand everything and going to one extreme. But then on the other hand, we have people who, who think they can do everything within a week and they want the cheapest prices and, um, and they, they, in, in that rush to just make these booking decisions and get the flight and get the hotel and everything sorted, of course, they don't even have time to consider any ethical or, or, or also safety issues that are in their own um, interest. So I would say, just plan a little bit ahead because it can also be in your own interest, um, but especially when going to destinations that can be dangerous as well. But wouldn't using like, let's say I'm in a hurry and I want to leave next week to go to, I don't know, Malawi and actually wouldn't that be a great customer for Fair Voyage to, to work with because I don't have the time to like find out the most ethical person. So 
the most ethical way of, of traveling through Malawi. So actually that's like your ideal customer, the last second guy who just says, Hey, I want to go there, but I want to do it right. Cause I have these values. And then you. Sure. And we've had these customers and, and they're perfect because it, it's quick money, right? So we right. love these customers. We right. don't want to spend a year of <laughs> converting a customer from right. uh, from a lot of questions to the final booking. Um, now, however, I mean, you have lived and traveled extensively in Africa, right? So you kind of an extreme uh, case. Now, mm. most people from Europe, if they go to Malawi or to Africa the first time, I mean, first, I think most people wouldn't actually just leave it in a week. And second, the likelihood or the chance that these people are not aware that they actually want to make ethical and sustainable booking decisions is very high. Um, mm. That people who leave it last minute probably are not aware of that yet. Mm. And so the only thing they do is they go online and look for the cheapest price and they don't have the time to consider that there might be a reason for these price differences. Um, so what other mistakes that you see people make when they're planning their travel? What's like a common thing that you see like that irritates you and you wish that you somehow could change? <clears throat> There's not many things that irritate me. Or I think it's you really or... always coming. It's coming down to planning and preparation. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, that people figure out last minute um, mm -hmm. that they need some special equipment and they haven't thought through that they might need hiking boots to go to Kilimanjaro, or um, they just just leave things way last minute. They think, okay, they book one part of the trip and they haven't booked the flight. And then they figure out, oh, the flights are like crazy expensive. Now they want to cancel their trip. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, being in the travel business, that can be frustrating if we get these last minute changes because people haven't planned ahead, but it's also not in the, per in the traveler's interest um, to just realize last minute that certain things are not possible because they haven't planned ahead. So just a little bit of preparation, I think. For me, that's the, that's the biggest thing. And I would even say that, so with myself, with climbing Kilimanjaro and cycling all the way through Africa, um, the only way or the only reason, or I think the number one success factor why I could do this is because I was planning ahead and I was researching and, and preparing for it and setting my mind to it. Um, so for me, it's really planning and preparation that I would recommend people. What about, um, can you travel ethically and responsibly by doing it in a way that is spontaneous? Because some people love spontaneous travel. They just like to go out there and travel spontaneously. Sure. So is there a way to do that ethically? Sure. And look, I'm, I'm by no means someone who says you shouldn't just book a flight, go somewhere, see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, of, of course you can do that. Um, so I'm not saying that um, only if you plan ahead, you can travel ethically. The only thing is, I mean, just be aware that there might be a social and ethical or sustainability component um, to, to prices. And then what, whenever you make a decision, um, then try to, to factor that into your decision. Now, we've been very much focusing on the, on the ethical social side. So when it comes to how people are treated and fairness um, for people, there is always a price component. However, if it's just about um, having low impact and traveling sustainably, of course you can go on a, on a camping vacation. You can pack your own um, tent and sleeping bag and you just book a flight and go and put up your tent, right? No harm. So mm -hmm. by no means we are saying that you shouldn't be doing that, those kind of trips. It's just when you make, when you book a bigger trip or you book with a, with a company, with a hotel, with a tour organization, then just understand that the price differences may not be purely um, because some companies just make more money than others. It may actually be because of fair treatment reasons. Fair enough. Um, what did, what was one of the big takeaways that you learned from your trip to go, uh, your bike trip across? I imagine there are so many lessons you learned about Africa, things that surprised you. I know in your Sudan video, you talk about basically, wow, this is, what I saw in Sudan doesn't match what I see in the news about Sudan. Um, but I imagine you ran into other surprises also along the way as you went through all those countries in Africa. What were some things that kind of stood out as like, wow, 
this is this is something I never expected. That was a lot of surprises. Mm. <laughs> so one thing is, mm. as you probably um, also made the experience, is the surprise or the aha moment, how different these countries are. I mean, there is no such thing as Africa, right? Every mm. single country is different. Mm. Um, I was, for example, very surprised that Malawi has mountains like Switzerland, yes. <laughs> which I didn't expect yeah. Yeah, yeah. to be Although climbing Although lacking the snow, my, they don't, like they don't have the snow. Um, they don't have the snow, but they have the hills, yes. certainly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it can like get pretty cold. It's I didn't like know Switzerland that it can get summer. so cold in Africa. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. If you had just gone a little bit further west, um, but you would more have from run a... into some Swiss swiss like mountains like you go up to like the renzuris of uh uganda there they have like yes. glaciers in fact right near the equator which is amazing anyway sorry i just yes you. yes yes yeah i've seen you've been up to the rubensaurus it's still mm. on my list to do it's amazing. um <laughs> and i would like to mention one thing because we are mostly talking about like this whole um ethical and, and sustainability mm. theme here so one thing that really shaped me through the cycling trip is i was really about to cancel my trip because of safety reasons i thought you know sudan terrorism and i thought okay is it really safe and should i really go there and i really had doubts and and at some point i was thinking i'm just playing with my life why am i doing this and so what i experienced or the big eye opener for me was that cycling for africa was in no way any more dangerous than cycling for the us or for europe there was nothing that made this trip abnormally dangerous of course sometimes we took a dangerous road which is like going on a highway in europe which you wouldn't do as a cyclist <laughs> and so you it's, it's it's it wouldn't be a fair comparison but just from um, how the people are and and how safe you feel day to day uh, i felt safe all the time actually and there was only a few instances on the road i said because we took a busy road that i didn't feel safe um but that's nothing specific to africa but overall just from you know would someone steal from me or rob me or um, any other crime i never had this feeling i really felt safe all the time and that for me was a big eye opener and also a big motivator um, for fair voyage because i've seen that even people and close friends who have followed me uh, with my blog that I was writing while I was cycling and have been able to follow that I was fine and that there was nothing dangerous about my trip. Even those people tell me now still they don't want to go to Africa because they think it's dangerous. So for me, a big motivation is just bring more people there and let them see with their own eyes because I think it will get rid of a lot of prejudice that we are still having. Yeah, absolutely. And your your blog name is is it Alex Cycles Africa? Is that right? That's right. I can't yes. remember. Wow, alexcyclesafrica.com. Amazing. I remember that uh, uh, from memory. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> yes. it. <laughs> um, and then of course fairvoyage.com for your company um which promoting sustainability and and, and That's right. Uh, I know these words are just so irritating. They great because they're like sustainability, ecotourism. You just hear them a million times and it, they've lost their meaning in so many ways. It must frustrate you because yes. it's so bandied about. I mean, I can't think of everybody just using that term. It's just so hard and that gets you jaded because at some point you just start, you know, like, ah, everybody's sustainable everybody's eco tourist so damn it who cares i'll just pick the cheapest guy out there <laughs> no you're right you're right definitely and especially on the eco side so there's a lot of hype about eco so what i sometimes find frustrating is that people bucket so when they hear sustainability all they're thinking is eco and carbon credits mm -hmm. So that is a challenge we have to deal with, where perception. And the second aspect is, as you say, everyone says they're eco-friendly and this and that. And what frustrates me a little bit is that a lot of um, both established companies as well as startups claim that they are having, they are now creating this standard and they know what to do and they know how to audit these local companies. Mm -hmm. And I think every new company and every new scheme that comes out and claims to create their own scheme 
they're just adding to the confusion. They're just making it more difficult for people because there's one more label amongst these thousands that we need to sift through. And the more of these labels we have, the less trust consumers have that any of those really mean something. So whereas we saying, no, we don't reinvent the wheel, we just work with what's already out there and we try to integrate in the ecosystem. But yeah, that's definitely something on the perception side that we need to deal with. Do you have any other big trips planned, Alexandra? <laughs> I have an exciting trip planned next year. I'm going to the TED conference for the first time in my oh, life in Vancouver. My goodness. So I'm really looking forward to that one. <laughs> as, an, as an attendee or as a speaker? Oh, I wish as a speaker. <laughs> Give me a few more years. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a good story, so you should be able to speak it. But yes, I, 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 is it still true that they, uh, the TED conferences, you have to apply to go to the TED conference? So you have to write an essay, like why you should go there? And, and not just in, in addition to the $10,000 bill or whatever it is? Exactly. That's right. Well, I wouldn't say it was an essay, but you have to write a few words okay. by you think. Yeah, I wonder, like, I wonder, like, how many people attendees. get, like, rejected for, like, not having written a thoughtful response. It'd just be interesting to know that. I mean, I mean, there must be. I mean, otherwise, they wouldn't waste people's time. Or maybe they want just people to think about it before they decide to go or maybe create a barrier. Or who knows? And anyway, but yes, that where, where is it going to be held at? Is it in Los Angeles or is it Vancouver? It's going to be in Vancouver, in okay. Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 2020. Wow. Mm -hmm. I see you there. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I can't afford it, but uh, maybe one day as a speaker, if I can pull that one off, that'd be great. I've done two TEDx talks, but that's the bar for a TEDx talk is very different than a TED talk. That's, uh, that's, that's tough, but yeah, but apparently the, the, the way to get on TED talks, you have to like start with a TEDx talk. That's what some people say. But who knows if that's actually true? But it's going to be. So I do have done two of those TEDx talks, yeah, right? Done, so yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I've done two TEDx talks, two different events. Um, but like I said, the bar for those things are is just so uh, actually, and even within TEDx, there's you know, like for example, TEDx. I don't know. Tiny little village TEDx is very different than TEDx. Let's say New York, for example, like or TEDx Berkeley. You know, the, there's some TEDx events that are huge and are very competitive and just, just big, big, almost like the the real TED conference. Um, and so there's different levels within TEDx itself. So um, anyway, so yeah, but you're gonna have a great time. Obviously, uh, people you go there for for the 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 people that you get to meet. Uh, the the uh, your fellow audience members that should be exactly that's, yes that's the Quite reason to do it. Um, cool. Um, that's that is going to be a big trip. And when when's the date for the next TED conference in Vancouver? I think it's in April. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, right. Yeah, I hope it's in April because otherwise you'll be snowed in in Vancouver. <laughs> not that you're afraid of snow <laughs> out there. Um, <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Alexandra, for, for enlightening us about uh, and making people think a little bit more carefully about their travel choices because just like when you decide to, whenever you spend your money, you're actually supporting something and you're supporting a, a, a company, a, a, a way of making the product or delivering the service. And sometimes we don't think about that when we make choices, uh, monetary choices, and when we send our money somewhere. So, and so I think it's, I, I'm happy to have you educate people about that. Thanks so much, Francis, for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks for giving attention to this topic. Sure, no problem. And as a bonus, Oreo, Oreo, come, come. I want to just leave with this one. Can I come? Oreo. I'm taking care <laughs> of this little, he's a puppy. <laughs> uh, look at this cutie <laughs> <laughs> so for those who are just listening to the podcast is he grown up no, or is he a puppy a he's only like three months old so anyway oh, so, so if, you, if you heard some 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 stuff in the in the uh, background it's, he's guilty for having done this um